So I have a question for you this morning to think about. So in general, do you tend to be a person who is too fast at things or too slow at things? Now, I know I asked some of my family that question this week, and they said, it depends. And, and, and I agree with that, right? Because in different times or seasons or circumstances, maybe sometimes we're too fast and at other times we're too slow. I know for me, you know, there's some things that I, I'm too slow at at times. Sometimes I'm too slow to repair things that are broken. Sometimes I'm too slow to clean up after myself and after projects I'm working on. Sometimes I'm too slow to correct behaviors that need to be changed in my life or in other people's lives. But I also know sometimes I'm too fast at things. I'm, I'm a chronic picker-upper. So if I'm going through uh, my house and there's something out of place, I tend to pick it up and put it in its place. If there's a drawer open or a door open, I tend to close it. If there's a light on, I tend to turn that off. Anybody else with me? I got a few of you out there. All right. Uh, but here's what I've noticed about this. When, when I tend to be either too fast or too slow, the reaction it gets in the other people around me is usually the equal and opposite direction. So particular to that picking up, closing doors, turn off lights thing, you know what answer I normally get from the other people in my house? Hey, I wasn't done with that yet, Right. But I have, as I've pondered this, I've thought about this, that there are a few things that we should never be slow at. So we should never be slow to pick up our dirty clothes off the floor. Amen? You should never be slow to laugh at my dad jokes, and you should never be slow to bake cookies. Like, those are things you should just never be slow at. So I'm just going to lay that out there for you. So. But today, I want us to think about our relationship with God. So in our relationship with God, do you feel like God tends to be too fast or too slow in your life? You know, I, I, sometimes maybe we feel like God's a little too fast to, uh, to point out the things we need to change in our life, right? But are there moments in your life where you have felt that God was too slow? Have you ever felt that he was too slow in answering your prayers? God, I, I've, I've asked you and I've asked you and I've asked you, when, when are you going to answer this question, this prayer, this request? Have you ever felt that God was too slow in punishing wrong that was going on around you? You know, King David, he, man, he was... He was really quick to point this out to God, and, and I just want to read to you a little bit out of Psalm 55 this morning, uh, some of the things that he said to God about the wrong that was going on around him. David says this, God, listen to my prayer, and do not hide from my plea for help. Pay attention to me and answer me. Those are kind of demanding words, aren't they? That's not normally how we feel like we should talk to God. He goes on and he says, I'm restless and in turmoil with my complaint because of the enemy's words because of the pressure of the wicked, for they bring disaster down on me. So now listen to what David asked God to do. He says, God, confuse and confound their speech and let death take them by surprise. That's kind of harsh. That, that's, that's a lot bolder maybe than we are, but have you ever been in a situation where you felt like God wasn't paying attention to the wrong that was going on around you? And you said, God, when are you going to get this fixed? Have you ever felt that God was too slow in fulfilling his promises to you? Have you ever been in a season in your life where you thought maybe God had forgotten about you or that God doesn't care? And, and you've asked this question, you said, God, when are you going to deliver me and give me peace and heal my wounds and wipe away my tears and give me comfort and provide for my needs? And so this morning, as we continue in the book of 2 Peter, we're going to be in chapter 3, verse 8, here in just a minute, if you want to find that in your Bible. I want to give you some encouragement, because, because Peter's going to help us understand why maybe sometimes we felt that God was slow when actually God was up to something else entirely. You know, as we went through this short letter, we've already seen Peter remind us that the Bible is the source for truth, and that it talks about the past, but it is also very much about our present. We've seen him warn us of coming judgment that's going to catch those who don't believe in Jesus by surprise. And last week, we saw him correcting the claim of scoffers who believe God was failing to fulfill the particular promise of Jesus' second coming. And, you know, and a lot of times when we see people who are, are scoffers and who are rejecting and don't believe in God, you know, again, it usually has an equal and opposite reaction. So our, our tendency may be to want to say, well, I'm going to prove to you why God's real and why God did this right. And, you know, throughout history particular to this issue of, of Jesus' second coming, you know, there's been a lot of Christian leaders who've tried to point out to people, well, if you don't think he's coming, I'll tell you exactly when he's coming. And so here's just a short list of some of the particular dates people have thought Jesus was going to come again on. 
So after the first century passed and Jesus didn't show back up, the next date that most believers set their sight on was 500 AD based on some Old Testament scripture. And they thought, surely Jesus will come back in the year 500. Well, they didn't. And so then what did they do? Well, they said, well, maybe we got that wrong. Maybe it was 800 AD. And so they set their sights on 800 AD. Well, after that passed, the next really popular date was January 1st of the year 1000. They thought, surely within a millennium, a thousand years of Jesus being on the earth, he's going to come back. And so people watched and waited for January 1st, 1000, and that came and went. And they said, oh yeah, of course, it's got to be not a thousand years from, uh, from this century, but it's a thousand years from when Jesus died. So it's January 1st, 1033. Well, that didn't happen either. Next, another date was 1284, based on 666 years after Islam came into being. When the Black Plague came in 1346, people thought, surely this is the end. One particular mathematician pointed out that he thought that it was going to come on October 19th, 1533 at 8 a.m. in the morning. Christopher Columbus thought Jesus was coming back in 1656. John Wesley, after studying Revelation chapter 12, thought it was going to be 1836. A lot of people, many of us who were alive at this time, thought January 1st, 2000, something was going to happen. The world was going to end, right? And then John Wineland had predicted that the world would end on September 29th, 2011. When that didn't happen, he predicted May 27th, 2012. When, the, when that didn't happen, he said, no, it's really June 9th, 2019. <laughs> so you guys see that we can't quite do that, can we? So what should our response be to questions about whether God is slow in keeping his promises? Well, Peter's going to point this out for us here in 2 Peter chapter 3, taken up in verse 8. It says, dear friends, and I love that because we, we talked about this last week, right? This is Peter's term of endearment for us. It's, it's a, a reminder that these aren't just facts, but this is from someone who cares and cares about us and cares that we get headed in the right direction. He says, dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. So before you guys start getting out your calculators and a scratch pad, and you start trying to figure those numbers out so you can calculate the end of the world, I just want you to understand that he's not talking about specific numbers, but he's referencing Psalm 90, which is a psalm that was written by, by David that talks about the fact that God is a beyond and above time, so much so that our view of time and our life is so insignificant compared to the vastness of who he is. And if you read through that psalm, you're going to see some really important things about time. One is, is that our view of time is irrelevant. As you read that, you're going to see that God's creation transcends anything we could imagine. The ability for God to do something out of nothing is beyond our understanding. And God was before there was time. And so in contrast, our life is just but a fleeting vapor. It also points out to us that time doesn't impact God's plan. Do you know that God never gets in a rush? Like God never gets in that situation where he's like, I don't think I'm going to have time to get this done before I have to be to the next thing. Like he never looks at his to-do list and says, I'm never getting all of these things done. God is beyond time and above time and outside of time. And he always gets done the things that he plans and intends to do because he is in control. Prophet Isaiah put it this way, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways are beyond our understanding. But it also points out to us that a long delay doesn't mean that God isn't keeping his promises. He may just not be keeping them the way you want them kept. That his plan may not be your plan. And it's like we shared last week, we have to realize we're not at the end of the story. It's not over yet. God still has a plan and he still has a purpose for what's happening right now. So Peter goes on in the rest of this little section and gives us a reminder of things that we can know for certain about God's second coming. It goes on here in verse 9, it says, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you. If you're an underliner, that might be a good thing to underline. Isn't that good news that God's patient with you? Does anyone here other than myself ever need God to be patient with them? I need God to be patient with me. Right there, Peter reminds us that he is. You know, God has given us a lot of things that we know. And you know, we get together every week and we read the Bible and we study the Bible and we talk about some things that we need to make sure that we know and we understand. But there's a lot of things that are still a mystery. 
And I think a lot of the reason that God leaves things a mystery is because He wants us to seek Him. He wants us to, to, to pursue Him. He wants us to ask questions. I know at my house, there's a lot of questions that get asked. I've got six kids at my house, and, and, and they all have lots of questions. And here's some questions that we talk about a lot. Why do we have to do it this way? Like, that, that gets asked a lot. When am I going to get to do this on my own? That's another good question that gets asked a lot at my house. What would you do in this situation? Which is a great question, isn't it? It's that acknowledgement that, that maybe mom and dad do know one or two things, right? That, that's a good question. Or, or one of my favorites is, why do you believe that? And, and I get to share with them my heart and my belief and, and, and where I'm at. And I love those kind of questions. And then two more questions I get asked a lot is, will you give me the Wi-Fi password and can you get me some toilet paper? So those also <laughs> get asked in my house a lot. But, but, you know, those serious questions, they don't happen overnight. The, to get to that point where, where they start really unpacking what they believe in their heart and asking me to do the same thing, that doesn't happen overnight. Now, I'll tell you, if you have teenagers in your house, a lot of times it will happen late at night. You know, I can't tell you how many times we're getting ready for bed and one of the teens will wander in and sit down on the edge of the bed and say, hey, I've been thinking about something. And, and you know, and they have not talked to me all day long, but they waited till, you know, 11 o'clock at night to come in. But, but man, I, I want to get up and I want to shake the sleep out of my eyes and I want to sit at the edge of my bed because that is a, a life-changing moment when kids start asking those deep questions of life. And, you know, and that's exactly what God wants. He wants us to ask questions. And when we do, he says, I'm going to lean in, and I'm going to listen, and I'm going to share my heart with you if you're ready to hear it. Isn't that good to know that that's the kind of God that we serve? But verse 9 continues to explain why God is that way. Because it says here, The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. See, see God is not slow. He's patient. But also, God is not indifferent. He's merciful. God's not slow. He's patient. But God is also not indifferent. He's merciful. He wants us to know Him in a saving way. He wants to understand the, the weight of our, our shortcomings and our sins, but He wants to also understand the grace of what Christ did on the cross and through His resurrection. He wants us all to understand that. And aren't you glad that He waited for you? That He didn't come back before you got that opportunity to make that decision and to know that grace? And, you know, he wants that for other people. And, and maybe for you, you already have some people in your mind that, that you want that for too. And, and, if, and, and if you do, I just want you to think about that person. Who are the people in your life that you love and that you care about that you want to make sure that they know Jesus and, and what it means to be saved? I want you to get them in their mind, your mind because this is an urgent thing that Peter is talking about here. And so I want us to consider it this way. We're going to put up verse 9 again on the screen. And as we look at that, I've left some blanks in there because as, as we read through this, I want you to put the name of whoever that person is that you love and care about, that you want them to know the Lord. I want you to put their name in that slot because it says this, the Lord does not delay his promise as some understand delay, but he is patient with, enter their name, not wanting that person to perish, but wanting them to come to repentance. Doesn't that put that in a, in a more urgent frame for you? Do you see the importance of that? Do you see how grateful you are that, that God is patient and merciful waiting for that person to make that decision, but doesn't also make us want to go share that good news with that person? That's what Peter wants us to get. Because while God is patient and he's merciful, that doesn't mean there's an unlimited amount of time. Because he goes on here in verse 10 to share this. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. See, there's coming a day when wrongs are going to be righted. It's a sure thing. It's going to happen. And when that day happens, it's going to be sudden. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to catch some people off guard. And there's not going to be anywhere any of us can hide. You're not going to get away from this. You're not going to, you're not going to miss the second coming. It's going to happen, and you're going to see it front and center. And it says our works are going to be exposed. Who we are, what we've done, what we believe is going to be laid bare, and everything is going to change in that moment. Which all sounds pretty awesome, but maybe a little terrifying, right? And so the question for us today is, is since God is patient and He's waiting, but that day is coming, and there's an urgency to it as well, what do we do in the meantime? And so that's what Peter's going to share in the next couple of verses here. Verse 11. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct 
and godliness as you wait for the day of God and hasten is coming. And so the first thing that Peter wants us to see is that we need to live holy lives that are set apart for God's purposes. And we talked about this the first week as we looked at chapter one, because because God's grace is something that's a free gift. It's offered to us. It's not by our works. It's by faith alone and Christ alone through what he did on the cross and through his resurrection. But when we accept that grace and we understand that grace, it should change our life. It should lead us to want to obey and follow Jesus, which leads us to godliness. And, and when it says that we're set apart, set apart and holy are the same thing. And it means that, that, that you are different now when you're a follower of Christ. And what are you set apart for? You're set apart for God's purpose. You know, this summer in our Sunday school classes, we got to go through our 201 and 301 spiritual maturity classes. And in it, we talked a little bit about, about what it is that we're supposed to be doing as followers of Christ. And one of the things we're supposed to do is, is to fulfill God's purposes, which, which is really cool. We talked about the fact that the purpose that God has for your life was planned before you were born. So, so it's, it's not anything that you have to invent or come up with, or you don't have to worry like, I'm not sure I have a purpose. You have a purpose. God planned it for you before you were ever even born. And what is it? Well, Jesus put it this way in Mark chapter 16. He says, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. And so sure, you know, you're supposed to raise a family and work a job and, and take care of your bills and you know, all those things that you're supposed to do. You, you, those are parts of what we do every day. But in the midst of those mundane things, our underlying purpose is to tell everyone everywhere the good news about what Jesus has done in our life. That's why you exist. That's what he's called you to do, is to go about spreading the gospel and making disciples. And Peter reminds us in this phrase also that not only are we set apart to that purpose, but our actions are going to affect the timeline. I want to look back here, and I want you to see here in that last verse this really important word. He says, he says as you wait for the day of God and hasten is coming. Does everybody know what the word hasten means? It means to make sooner. And so he says, when we tell people about Jesus, we make Jesus' second coming sooner. We bring it closer. And when Peter was writing that, he probably was thinking of the words of Jesus from Matthew 24, where he says this, this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So when we've done that purpose of gone everywhere and told everyone about what Jesus happened, what Jesus did, what's going to happen? And then the end will come. So when I tell people about faith in Christ, it brings that end a little bit sooner. Your actions affect the timeline. And you know, as we read this letter, we see how passionate Peter is about this. And we'll realize, we'll talk about this here in a second, we'll realize this is at the end of his life. But if you read the story of Peter's life and you look through the scriptures, and particularly if you look through the book of Acts as you watch Peter after Jesus is resurrected and tells him to go start the church, you're going to see that this has always been Peter's passion. When Peter got up on the first day of Pentecost and, and preached the first Christian message, you know what he preached? That Jesus is coming again. And for those who believe in him, that's salvation. And for those who don't believe in him, that's going to be separation from God for eternity. So you need to know who Jesus is and accept him as your savior. That was his message day one. And, and here at the end, what's his message? Hey, Jesus is coming again. For those who believe in him, that's going to be salvation and eternal life. For those who don't, that's going to be separation and punishment. That was his message his whole life. Look at what he says here at the end of this, reading on in verse, verse 12. It says, Because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. You know, as you look, read through the book of Acts, one of the things that, that you might not notice, but, it, but if you kind of dig into it and think about it, you're going to see is that Peter didn't stay in Jerusalem. You know, that's, that's where this whole thing started. They, they were in Jerusalem and Jesus was crucified. And he came back and he told them to, to wait for the Holy Spirit. And then they got up in Jerusalem and preached the first message. And the church was born and it started to grow. But, but as we go along there, we find out that James, the Lord's brother, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And we can read into that, that most likely that was because Peter didn't live there anymore. Because Peter had taken that, that call that Jesus gave him to say, take this message to the uttermost parts of the world, and that's what he did. So he traveled to all of the known world and was taking the message of Christ all around because it was so important to let people know that Jesus was the Son of God who died for their sins and offering them salvation. 
And so he traveled and he taught and he ministered and he sacrificed because he felt the urgency of sharing the news of salvation and faith through Jesus. And then we get to these letters he wrote here at the end of the Bible, First and Second Peter. And if you read between the lines here, you realize that he was writing these from Rome. And history agrees that while he was in Rome, he was waiting to be martyred and eventually was killed for his faith, probably not too long after writing this letter we're reading right now. But listen to what he was waiting for, because he wasn't waiting for death, was he? Verse 13, it says, based on his promise, we wait for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. See, Peter wasn't waiting for death. He was waiting for renewal. If you guys have your driver's license with you, I want you to get it out for a minute. And uh, when you get it out, I want you to find the expiration date on your, on your license. We'll see if anybody's in trouble this morning, right? <laughs> see, has anybody ever realized that theirs was out, out of date? Yeah, I've, I've known several people who have done that in the past, right? So, so you might get, get a nice surprise this morning. So, so mine is November 19th, 2023. Whew, I'm good for a couple more years, right? So, but if yours is getting close or perhaps has already passed, what are you going to have to do? You have to get renewed. Where do you have to go to do that? The license bureau, right? And, and you know, it's kind of this stereotypical joke in our culture, right? Uh, that, that going to the license bureau is just slightly less bad than everything you love and know being burned up in fire, right? And that you probably got a long wait and you probably won't have everything you need. But you know, I'm so thankful that we live in a small town like Buffalo, and I, I know for me, going to our license bureau is nothing like that, right? Uh, if you go to our license bureau, you know what's going to happen? Someone is going to cheerily greet you and tell you that they're glad you're there. And they're going to serve you with a smile. And they're going to help you make sure you know all of the things that you need to do to get whatever transaction you need going. And, and it's going to be a pleasant experience. And I'm thankful for that. I'm think, thankful that we are not the typical license bureau here in Buffalo, Missouri, because they make renewal pleasant in our life. And, you know, that's exactly what Peter's message to us is today, is that for those of us who know Jesus as Savior, what we're waiting for is worth the wait, because we have an assured renewal that's coming when Christ comes back because of what He's done in our life through His good grace. So we put our hope in Him, and we know for those who don't know Jesus as, as their Savior, this delay is because God loves them and desires that they know him and not perish, but be renewed. You know, there's going to be a day when Christ is going to physically return to judge everything. It's, it's a fact. It, it, Peter, Peter knew that and believed that just as much as he believed Jesus in the flesh that he saw and the resurrection that he saw. He had just as much faith in that future coming as he did in the coming that he witnessed. And it's going to happen. And when that happens, for those who find their, their names written in the book of life because of their faith in Jesus, they get to go on to an eternal reward called heaven. For those who do not, they're going to be cast into punishment in a lake of fire known as hell. And these are real places. And so as we think about this today, and Peter's message us today, here's the question for us. What are we waiting for? What are you waiting for today? Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Have you asked him to be the leader of your life? If you haven't, what are you waiting for? He's offering. He's waiting. That's his desire for you to do that. And when we do, we're going to find forgiveness and wholeness and goodness of God in our life. And for those of us who have done that already, what are we waiting for? Are we sharing the good news with those around us, hastening the day when Jesus will come back and set things right? We want to see him set things right, but we must be about his purposes, don't we? Are you trusting in the good grace of God to give you hope and peace and patience during this season between Jesus' arrivals? Maybe for you today, maybe you have doubts. Maybe you're a part of some of the things we've talked about with scoffers and skeptics. What doubts do you need to bring to him today? He's ready, he's listening, he's waiting. What frustrations are you experiencing that you need to let go of and trust that God, who is beyond time, has control of them? And what situations today do you just need to surrender in and say, this is beyond me, but God, I believe that you have an answer. I'm going to surrender to you. You know, Peter wants us to know today that Jesus is patiently waiting for you, 
but we have to respond. So will you come to Jesus today? Would you guys stand with me?